Wait, what? Right now? Oh, shit. Are we streaming already? Yeah, I was just trying to get your Oh, shit. Oh. That's not <laughs> good. <laughs> Duly noted. Duly noted. Are we... Why are we doing these so early, anyways? Oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, do you right. want me to run and turn some noises off? Uh, I'll do that. Okay. Do you already turn the fan Can off? you do the intro? Oh, Kevin, by the way, we've got a, a jingle you've got to learn at some point during the live stream. Okay. It's going to be super fun. Awesome. Super excited. We are, uh, we're wrong right now, by the way. Oh. Oh, hi. What? <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Uh, Ish, Ish with Fish is also live streaming right now. That's a... Uh, Dang it. They're going to steal all of our fans. Because fishing and beer, right? There we go. Did you just reuse the thumbnail from last week? You did, didn't you? Oh, and the, uh, all the stream tags, too. This Lisa chick says hi, Kevin. Wait, what? <laughs> Lisa Hill. <laughs> hey, she actually changed her, her oh, name. It used that. to be uh, something else. <laughs> no, it was a joke. It's actually Lisa. No, I, I, yeah. I get it. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, somebody's already commenting. Did you say fishing and beer? Um, hey, everyone. Welcome to our live stream. Uh, let us know how we're sounding here. Sorry, we lost track of time today, so um, we are a little bit behind. Let me get this turned off, too, just so we can read comments yeah. on people's stuff. That's a good idea. Stuff. I like that. Um, <coughs> thank you. Sounds like we're uh, sounding good. We'll uh, get Peter over here in just a couple more seconds. And, uh, GSI. Where is everyone tuning in from this morning? Let's uh, do that before we do our intro here. Um, let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from. Let us know how we're looking. It looks like I'm a little dark, but Kevin is looking quite white, so. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty pale right now. <coughs> it's been you a long summer of being inside all day. <laughs> it's Moby Dick! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as you as you will see, we uh, have a special guest. Nice, we got so we got someone from uh, UK. We got Winnipeg, Canada, Florida, Michigan, Maryland, Damn. Mississippi, Idaho. That's like that's the closest one yet. Slovakia, nice. Uh, ah, Spokane. Never mind. I got so much. Nobody likes that so city, much pressure, right? Like, know what I'm talking about now? There's yeah. so many people. Yeah, you 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 have quite literally the entire world watching awesome. you. Yeah. Crap. <laughs> Everyone. And I, and yes. I only just learned how to there beer. Are, there are currently beer. 43 people in the world. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I guess Peter's screwing around on the computer. So let me uh, go ahead and uh, do the intro for everyone. Uh, so, what's that? I know you did. Well, we're working on it. You see, it's a slow thing. It's building suspense right now. <laughs> we got one minute till 10:50. Uh, we, we are late today. Wichita, Kansas. Nice. Um, all right, everyone, welcome to the Genus Brewing live stream, uh, the live stream that we do on YouTube every Sunday morning at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time. So we have to mention that because, because not, every people are all not everyone is on Pacific Standard Time. Um, and uh, yeah, for those of you that are tuning in for the first time, uh, the general breakdown is that we start out with some Genus news and brewing news going on around the nation. Uh, and then we go into a beer of the week where we break down a BJCP, for the most part, style uh, and give you kind of all of the goodies involved with that and uh, some fun ingredients to work with on it. Um, and then from there, we go into a couple different discussion topics before we close out the session uh, by opening it up to general questioning for all of you out there in the YouTube world. Uh, today, we've got uh, some fun things uh, when it comes to uh, our discussion topics. We actually have, uh, let me introduce Kevin Green with Paramore Brewing now, right? Yep. Uh, Paramore Brewing, brand new kind of startup brewery in Spokane. Um, but I've been involved with a few breweries around here now. I'm yeah. kind of actually the brewery whore of Spokane. Yeah, you, you're, you're a bit me. of a, a brewery hopper. A little bit. Uh, <laughs> this will be, be number five. I am a slut. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this will be number five. I've worked <laughs> both on the production side, on the serving side, on the sales side, on the distribution side, and now I'm back to the brewing side, um, which is kind of exciting. I'm doing a little bit of sales, a little bit of brewing. Again, we're small. We're a yeah. startup, so it's kind of a, you know, yeah. you don't have one job anymore. You're yep. kind of doing everything. 
Yeah, and you uh, you kind of started your days at, uh, let me see, it was was it Steam Plant? Yeah, I was that at you, Steam Plant right downtown. You got your first job, and I, that's kind of when I met you. And, uh, yeah, you were just kind of getting into the homebrew thing then. And since then, you've really sort of uh, uh, gotten into sours hardcore. And uh, yeah. so that's kind of going to lead into our um, sort of discussion topics today. We're going to be talking about turbid mashing and then also... Um, mixed fermentation schedules. So mm -hmm. I think that you are kind of going to be an, a great go-to guy for that because uh, both on the homebrew and a commercial scale, um, I think you've been experimenting with a whole lot of that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, a lot of it. Um, kind of an excessive amount. You guys see me at least once or twice a week just oh, yeah. picking up grains <laughs> and malt for it. <laughs> yeah. The fact, the fact that I had a whiskey barrel, a full-size whiskey barrel at home for sour for just myself. So before we go on, overkill. how much beer do you have at your house right now? Right now is actually low. Uh, I only have six kegs on tap right now. Um, but, I, usually, but how much are in fermenters? <laughs> about 100 gallons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was like, I'm pretty sure you have like... No, I have backups You have like one of them. Five or ten fermenters I'm used to having a, a uh, semi-legal amount of them. <laughs> Hey, uh, 250 gallons, under yeah. 250 gallons. Yeah, no, so that's I'm, always the Bree's answer. at the house, too, so I have an extra <laughs> house member to, 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 to you know, make that number bigger. But, um, <laughs> no, usually I'm brewing a lot more. I moved my homebrew set up to my dad's shop just so we can have an actual fermentation chamber, have a little bit more temperature control on it, um, nice. and having a clean beer versus a sour beer area completely <laughs> separate, everything. Yeah. Yeah, because when you do have that many crazy things going on, well, there, there's I've definitely some, track. some I've potential I've had a couple issues. where the Carboys, for some reason, the tag fell off when I was doing nice. a sample. And I'm like, cool, Mystery I don't know beer. what this is, but I know I brewed it roughly this time frame. Call it good. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah, so doing a little bit of everything. but Yeah. All righty. Well, let's get into some genus news to start this out with. Um, we got uh, not a lot this week, actually, um, other than um, we do, did get some new seltzer nutrients from Omega Yeast uh, to try out. They have their, it's their proper pitch, I believe, nutrient pack, which is actually really, really awesome, uh, especially from a uh, kind of retail and homebrew standpoint, because up until now, we've had quite a few customers interested in brewing hard seltzers. Uh, but trying to explain to them how we do our nutrient schedules, mixing you know firm K and firm O and and uh, the, and the DAP in there to try to get the right blends at the right times. Um, this sort of takes all that guesswork out, and so it's one. It's pretty reasonable. I think it's like five bucks too for um, a pack of this nutrients, and uh, and yeah, you can just pitch that in there, and it should make for a fantastic seltzer. Um, also, uh, plum sour should be on tap, but it's not. It's in the back, though. Oh, you had, you did actually bring it in. Why do you think I built an aquarium oh, yesterday? Okay, so Plum Sour will be on tap at some point today. Um, it is on tap. <laughs> it's on tap. It's next to on tap. Uh, I also built an aquarium, which and, is more fun um, news. And then we finally got our next side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side, um, in the works. Uh, that was, when was that? That was day before Friday. Yeah, that was a day. Um, so we got uh, the Bonanza that we talked about last week, the Sundew, and, um, and then we compared those to um, just the Kaiser, which is a classic German ale strain in a sort of three-way blonde to see how those yeast strains kind of come through and the difference between them with obviously the Kaiser sort of being our, our neutral base to work with. Because so. everything's better in a three-way. Yes, as I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and otherwise, uh, yeah, that's about it for news around Genus. So. Kevin, what, uh, what, uh, what Paramore slash other homebrew news do you have? Um, so, yeah, Paramore, we just uh, kind of contributed. We're doing a 12 beers at Christmas with some of the local breweries. Um, kind of did, or that was right. Yeah, so we did it with them. <laughs> <laughs> this is more Anthony. My partner, Anthony, kind of set this all up, so I'm kind of getting the secondhand news, actually. But basically, uh, we all contributed a beer, and you can get kind of at your local breweries. I know Humble Abode just had it, and they just sold out of their 12 packs. Nice. Uh, it was 60 bucks, and you get one beer from 12 different local breweries uh, from around the Spokane area. So that was kind of a cool out-the-gate kind of thing. Um, right now, with Washington being so shut down uh just with COVID, everything restricted. on the patios restricted i like, I like to say restricted yes. let's yeah restricted hands tied <laughs> behind our backs whatever kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> but like in the less kinky way um <laughs> i mean i don't know there's well, some, there's some pretty big uh, penetrations going on fair enough yeah um, that's true we've most, all bent over at least once <laughs> most of our distribution is been in idaho so i've been doing a lot of that stuff um 
we've been doing some specialty small bat stuff. That pink beer that you like of mine, I nice. just brewed on their system. It's fantastic. Which I am really excited about. That's a beer I've been doing at home for a long time. It's called La Vie and Rose, Rose Hip Hibiscus Raspberry Quick Sour, which I'm really excited to actually get that out. And Into the world? Yeah. More well, people need to taste that. That's that's like the one beer that I've like physically asked you for. Like, the next time you make this, I need this. I'll make sure I get you one. <laughs> um, but, no, it's – pretty uh slow right now like i said we're a startup so i mean there's not a whole lot of news we are looking currently we're still not even at brick and mortar we actually are contracting from bellwether space right now which is another local spokane beer uh brewery uh so we're kind of doing that we've got a small shop in the county line so we're able to use that shop uh with a one barrel system we just picked up 24 cab soft barrels as well from um Pepperbridge Ooh. Winery down in Walla Walla, nice. and we picked up six punch-in barrels from a Bayhaw. Uh, and my boss has basically told me, fill them up. You know, I've got <laughs> a, I got plans for each of them. We're doing some grisettes, some lambic style, some um, which we can't call lambic because it's you know. So the whole hundred percent lambic. <laughs> yeah, well, the whole joke was that Russian River called it Sinambic, so I want to call it Spokambic. Oh, I like it. That's which awesome. I, I like trademark it. in that shit, too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you better, you better trademark that. Um, Just call it Spokane style. Spokane. Before, before yeah, July, Spokane style Lambic, Lambic but I, I want to call it Spokambic. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. But um, I can feel, by the way, with all those barrels, I can feel Tim just getting jealous right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I well, it was funny when I told Anthony, I was like, "Hey, like, I want to do a barrel program." He's like, "Yeah, I'll get you." Tell him, "Like, cool, like maybe like you know four or five. He's all right. I'll get you like twenty-four. What? <laughs> sure, cool. Not gonna argue that. Like, yeah. <laughs> I want to get them started. I know how long they take, and it's I'm, awesome that he's willing to pull the trigger on that because you'll you'll be one of the best. Uh, well, probably the probably the best if they're all going to be sours. Uh, yeah, uh, the first the couple runs ones. will be. All the wine ones will be, although we are going to do about six of them with a couple of cleans. We have an Imperial Stout coming. Oh, cool. We have a rye whiskey and a bourbon that need to be filled. Yeah. So I figured doing a 10 barrel, fill both of those and two red wines. And then going and then sour. going yeah. something else. And then they'll be soured <clears throat> after that. Yeah, by the time, I mean, this is like, you know, probably two years plus down the road. But by, by the time you get into blending and everything like that, yeah. that'll be probably the most dynamic sour program in Spokane, I want to say. Yeah, behind yeah. maybe Iron Goat would be the only yeah. people that I would say. Yeah, but they do, they have the big filters and they don't, they have a handful of barrels, but they don't, I, I don't think they blend like you do at home. No, they t keep it pretty typical. They, this yeah. beer is this beer kind exactly. of thing. Yeah, one, one barrel is one beer, so. Yeah, uh, and I know that my plan right now is to taking those six punch-ins. And basically making them as mini fooders, getting adapters on them. Not yeah. the man ways, but at least the adapter. This barrel is this culture. This barrel is this culture. And kind of going from nice. there to barrels and then blending, back blending from there. Yeah. That'll be super fun. <coughs> I, think, I think Spokane's actually ready for a good blending program. Too. We, yeah, they, we really we need it. I feel it. like we well, don't have anyone that's... We need somebody that's <sighs> passionate about sours. Like not yeah. just does sours as a side project, but passionate and has the resources. We're passionate about sours, but we don't have... We have that much space right, <laughs> right there. Well, I've noticed it so much because like I, I travel four a lot. barrels packed in yeah. there. And everywhere I travel, like, you go to Seattle, and there's breweries that are completely dedicated to sour. You go to Portland, there's breweries that are completely dedicated yeah. to sour. Yeah. And it's a good niche. It's, I mean, Spokane's obviously behind those bigger cities, but we're getting there. Yeah, for sure. We have the, I think we have the beer drinkers already. We just don't have the. That should be Spokane's beer it. motto. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. We're 20 years behind. Well, Spoke I mean, you look at what? Was it about five years ago? There was a brewery that was trying to do that. Yeah, and they and did a really Brian good job. Up, but, yeah, uh, and then Brian ended up having a baby and got a job back as a lawyer where he made like triple digits so it makes yeah. sense like <laughs> get the fuck out of the industry because oh yeah no we don't make anything <laughs> if someone if yeah if someone gives me a baby in a in a job that makes you know six figures i will probably take it <laughs> yeah. i already have the baby part yeah i was gonna say it. <laughs> it's no i mean ramblin right? ramblin road uh, was you know it was gonna be great yeah but it just i understand why but I, i'm i think spokane's ready for it yeah i think so it's gonna be good all right, well, that pretty much covers our beer news today. So uh, now it's time for you to learn the jingle that we do every single week. Uh, we're going <laughs> to sing the jingle the first time, and then uh, the second time you're going to join in us, uh, in with us. Awesome. All right. I need some of that beer if that's going to be the case. <laughs> yeah, let's get it going. <laughs> and Great. it'll be perfect for our... Uh... Oh, that was such a beautiful sound, I'm sure, <laughs> that microphone. Oh, yeah. That's why I put it as close I was, I was, I was trying to lead us, lead us in. Oh. Th this beer is going to be perfect to go with our... Beer of the week, bump, 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 beer of the week, blue whip. All right, you got it? <laughs> I got it. <laughs> All right. So like I said, this beer is going to be perfect to go with our beer, beer of the week, bump, 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 beer of the week, <laughs> <laughs> 
God, you guys are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not. I love it. It's absolutely perfect. <laughs> Every week. This. No. Uh, and this, uh, t- this week's beer of the week is actually a wild ale, also known as American wild ale. Uh, and basically, this beer is a mixed fermentation beer that takes uh, classic Saccharomyces fer- uh, fermentation and blends it in with wild, and I'm using wild in quotations for a good reason, um, wild strains, such as Brett and other mixed culture bacteria. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And uh, Peter, tell us more about wild ales and what BJCP <laughs> category that is, since uh, you, you, you got this all out. outlined. I don't even know if it is a BJCP category. It might be. It's uh, a it 16 E, I believe. 16 E. I think that's correct. That would have popped up in the yeah, in the new in the new one. I, I was pretty sure it was. Uh, so was, we'll we'll go with 16 E until I'm done. 20, <laughs> until I'm 28 done. C. I was 28 C. That's pretty yeah. So yeah, 16 no, E is Belgian. Yeah, almost, sure. almost double. Number and a letter. That's why I said it, guys. <laughs> Uh, but this uh, this uh, particular style, I use this in air quotes because although uh, a lot of breweries do do this successfully as a wild ale, i.e. Uh, no inoculation, um, uh, the majority of the uh, commercial examples that you can find actually are done with specific inoculation, making them not wild, but still in the category of wild ale because they use Britannomyces, they use uh, uh, Lactobacillus, they use uh, Pediococcus. Um, ingredients that are traditionally wild. Or yeah, you'd, you'd normally, you'd normally catch them in, in, the, in, yeah, in the wild. Like a Pokemon. I was going to say, is this like, do I need a Master Ball, Great Ball? <laughs> what are we doing? Well, it depends on which one you want. <laughs> uh, but uh, so w- what you end up with basically is a, uh, a farmhouse, sometimes sour, but not always sour style ale. Um, they can have a pretty broad range of uh, characters, actually. 26C. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> 28. Normally, we've got a lot more notes wild to work with, Peter. Beer is 28C. American Wild Ale is 28. And so there's that yeah, wild specialty beer. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would fall under the 28C, the wild specialty beer. Um, I don't know. Gen- generally, category 28, I guess we're just covering in general. Yeah, it's kind of in the whatever <laughs> in general because you have wild specialties, you have but, bread, uh, mixed fermentations. Yeah, let's go wild specialties. <coughs> Dude, someone's uh, talking about Propolis. We actually used to carry Propolis beers, mm-hmm. uh, and Propolis is really fun because they actually cultured their own strain of bread from mm-hmm. bees, which yeah. is where they got their name from. Yeah, that was yeah. – they're awesome. I haven't had them in a yeah. long time. They used to make it out here a lot more. Yeah, well, Crew Crew Selections carried them for a while. Right. Um, Amber, who now owns what's the bar that Amber owns? Do you remember? Do you know Amber? Amber. She was the the the, the rep for Crew Selections. Oh no, I don't know her. Well, she's the one that uh, sold me Propolis but stuff. <laughs> and as for 28C, since <laughs> we're sticking on topic, um, we got it. So it is a general sour or funky version of a fruit, herb, or spice beer with wild uh, or wild beer aged in wood. <laughs> if wood aged, the wood should not be the primary or dominant character. So yeah, kitchen sink style when it comes to sour beers. Uh, and I think the biggest thing is that uh, you can actually propagate yeast from the wild for these. So mm-hmm. obviously they're gonna be highly variable. Um, it literally for, you know, appearance and the overall rest of the description, it's talking about, you know, it has the characteristics of the quote unquote base style beer, which could basically be anything um, that, that you're working with. Um, and yeah, they can be clear, they can be hazy. Um, the flavor's obviously gonna be variable. Um, the acidity should balance nicely with, um, you know, tannins from fruit or wood. Um, but uh, <laughs> wood, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know you're often going to have poor head retention due to the extended fermentation times on these beers and the lack of dextrins and the lack of dextrins that are left over, but not necessarily at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, as we're going to talk about. That's a, that's a um, foreshadowing, by the way, everyone. And before we get and too much into uh, into specific style stuff, let's also talk about some fun ways that this is done commercially, because. Um, yeah, a lot of breweries will actually build houses just for this style. Mm-hmm. Um, have you have you heard of the the Jester King one where they got the basically got they've got a house that's got open windows on the outside? Yeah, and that, yeah, that's where they. Well, that's a uh, oh, what is it? It's like American Solera project or whatever. It's built like their own like room with it. Yeah. Um, even Barrel Works for Firestone has a completely separate facility that's specific for this. Yeah. Um, so they're able to find ways to actually so they're. All this to say there are good quality, if you're doing this repeatedly, if you're doing this a lot of times, there are really good quality ways to do this from wild yeast and wild yeast alone. What, yeah. what, did, what did they say in Family Guy? Cool ship? Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool ship? ship. <laughs> That's, yeah, that was, <laughs> yes. Was that, was that a good joke or a bad joke? I don't that, was know. A, that was a great joke, and we are moving on. <laughs> it was a Logan joke. <laughs> to the hop of the week. Uh, and uh, what is the hop of the week, Peter? What variety of the hop is this? Uh, the hop of the week is leaf. 
<laughs> and D bitter leaf specifically. Uh, the hop of the week is uh, D, is D bitter. So generic. It, can, it can be pretty much any hop. It doesn't really the matter. Beer of the week is a nail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, actually, um, what's their faces? Yakima Valley Hops actually sells D bitter hops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they got do. it as a package. Yeah, just specifically a lot of for places do actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah Lambic style beers, older, just kind of that cheesy. Yeah, they're just yeah, they're, they they've been left out. Hopefully beyond um, cheesy. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, and the reason this is is because although the alpha acids are an antimicrobial property, they are in um, hops. There are still other antimicrobial properties that are in hops after the alpha acids have degraded. Um, and so uh, you want to use debittered hops because too much alpha acids in your actual beer itself can actually select against certain bacteria. And you want to uh, you want to be able to allow whatever's going to grow in there to grow in there. That's not going to kill you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can uh, <laughs> if you can't you know access these you can actually make your own at home it's literally leaving your hops out on the counter for a year um you're gonna end up with debittered hops i mean i um, maybe not leave them on the counter your girlfriend or wife might kill you but uh, put them in the <laughs> attic somewhere warm yeah exactly like yeah it. i know that uh, do the opposite of what we normally tell you to do which is you know keep them in a freezer sealed up um, basically let the oxygen get in there mm -hmm. and do its nasty bits and yeah and you know a nice warm temperature well that's what i've been doing so i have nine hot plants in my house every year i harvest them but i end up with like four hot plants worth of just hops Put them in the garbage, or not garbage bags, like Ziploc bags that are kind of just. Put them in, you take put them the in the hops, garbage. Put them directly. A little bit of old banana peel in there, you know, whatever. No, you put them into like Ziploc bags and you kind of leave them cracked a little bit. You just push them up and throw them in the attic and yep. then it'll get warm. That'll do it. For a couple sure. years later, grab them. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so uh, this is traditionally done for a Lambic style beer, which I guess, uh, you know, uh, an American Wild Ale can be probably considered a, d a descendant of Lambic or traditional Lambic. Um, but uh, obviously, it's taken on a huge. Uh, uh, variants since then, but debittered hops are the way to go because they have the hops that you need for being hops. Um, Flavor-wise, they add a little bit, but they don't. They don't actually add a lot because you're not using a ton of these debittered hops. Um, but uh, I don't know. What would you What do you say? They get the. It's more about getting it so you're not over the top sour. Yeah. Because if you don't have any in there, the the microbes might take over a little bit. Yeah. So um, you kind of want to hit for that low IBU just to inhibit the bacteria from just becoming acidic. Yeah. You know, you don't want vinegar. I've done it a few times and that's I mean that's where blending comes into play. You get something that's a little less and you can start doing a you know, yeah. a little bit balance. Acetobacter is, is uh inhibited by uh hops then? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um hops and oxygen, yeah. Uh, hop, the oxygen's the more the main thing, but it's more Yeah, making just, sure it's anaerobic. Yeah. But it's more also that your pedio or pedio pedio. <laughs> your pediophile. <laughs> your pedio <laughs> doesn't um take over too much, you know, and you just you get a little bit less. A little uh, bit less ropiness. Yeah, a little bit less ropiness, a little bit less aggressive on the sour. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the debittered hops. Uh, basically, get some hops. You can eat buy, buy debittered hops, but it's kind of a waste of money if you just have extra hops. And I prefer to use leaf for these uh, just for tradition. Uh, I don't know. The pellets probably still work, but I feel like old pellets smell worse. So yeah. So I don't use them. I've always noticed that because we always ended up at the brewery so I've worked for with boxes of old hops. And it's like, yeah. I don't really want to use a 11-pound bag of Glacier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really... That sounds oddly familiar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go on to our malt of the week. Our malt of the week this week is unmalted wheat. So we use unmalted wheat uh, um, for a lot of things. Uh, it can be used in regular beers just for like building body and head retention in a small percentage. But it actually has a unique uh, place in American wild ales uh, specifically to feed things that aren't regular beer yeast. Yeah, so we're trying to get as much, uh, basically, just starches out of this wheat as possible, and that's why we don't want it to be malted. Um, we're really trying to um, sort of, I saw somebody actually did in the comments, uh, is, oh, Dirk, is this opposite beer? And um, <laughs> kind of, Dirk, actually, because um, sort of. when it comes to the mashing process, <laughs> um, you're actually going to try to maintain as many of those starches as possible into the final wort, um, and that just leaves a lot of unfermentable sugars. Um, that uh, strains like Britannomyces can actually continue to chew on over time and break down and produce fantastic flavors as a result. Um, we're talking um, for a grist spill, what are we thinking, like 40% or so? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't 30? do more than 50. Yeah. Uh, I'd say about 30 to 40 is about yeah, right, for, that's, especially if you're doing that Lambic style where you're yeah. having about that. So, yeah, I think so for Lambic specifically, 30% is like the traditional like, yeah. Yeah. Lambic bill, but you can definitely go higher than that. So, uh, yeah, you could do uh, – so anything unmalted wheat, um, torrified wheat, if uh, if you don't have unmalted, would also work. Um, that's, it might give you a little biscuity character, but, you know, it might be good too. So 
Um, yeah, because torrefied wheat is also unmalted. It's just been it's just baked in puffed. an oven. Yeah, yeah. It's made in, it's made into corn puffs. Corn puffs. Uh, wheat puffs. Wheat puffs. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, unmalted wheat. The malted wheat for American Wild Ale. Uh, Kent, hey, number one fan. I appreciate it. Thanks for the super chat so much. I love the the dancing pear. What is that? Is that a pear? Yes. It's a it's a dancing blob. Dancing blob. <laughs> Hold this here so you can see it too. Oh, yeah. um, um, all right, let's go to under our use of the week. Our use of the week is going to be Brett Brooks. If you're going to fake this style, I think Brett Brooks is one of my favorite Bretts to add to a mixed fermentation beer. Um, fermented warm or fermented long, those are the two kind of options with that. Brett Brooks can give you an immediate like barnyard kind of feel, which isn't necessary for an American Wild Ale, but it's one of my favorite flavors that can end up in American Wild Ale. Um, Nothing like nothing like licking that horse blanket. Yeah, a little bit of <laughs> little bit of horse blanket, a little bit of sweaty goat. Mm -hmm. Sweaty goat is my favorite description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so <coughs> Brett Brooks say you can get from pretty much every yeastery <laughs> that's liquid. Um, I know Omega has one, uh, and then they also have a lot of Brett blends that you can use too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the Brett blends actually, if you're just starting out, are a fantastic. They're the way best to get option. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like if you're just like, hey, I don't really have any cultures to work with. Yeah, getting getting one of the Brett blends, like you can't go wrong. With well, that it. was I remember my first time doing this was with the Rousselaire blend. Yeah, and yeah, it was like was, it's a I very traditional. Too, yeah, it's very traditional. It's easy enough. It tastes uh, really good. My thing now i've been doing because i like to drink obviously is buying other like uh, big breweries bottles and then propping up their dregs yeah yep. but, but then you don't really know what's exactly in there yeah it but the blends yeah. yeah the omega yeah. blends that you're getting you kind of know a general idea but some of them were just like hey it's 12 strains of brett yeah. cheers yeah <laughs> good luck cool <laughs> well and that was one of our that that first barrel that we did that first sour barrel that was just gold mm -hmm. that was actually it was give or take a year old yeast cake from the Rosalaire blend from a batch I had done at home mm -hmm. and I and I had kegged it up and it was yeah it was like a year old I don't remember what it was some kind of just basic sour actually and uh and yeah and so we took that and inoculated that barrel with it and, and then, then slowly started adding drinks as we got them yeah, yeah. <laughs> as we were killing the the bottle shop off <laughs> yeah well that was oh right I remember the bottle shop at the old location um <laughs> no my first the barrel i had i just emptied in my house 53 gallon whiskey barrel i ended up doing a big starter like rousselaire with a little bit of rustic saison yeast and i was like cool awesome let's keep it at that and then one day we had a bottle share and i have no fucking clue what i ended up adding to the barrel because <laughs> as the night went on every bottle was okay well we'll just dump that in there <laughs> then it ended up being one to 15 bottles of dregs the yeah one to 15 mystery that's a pretty beer. big range to not know how many you added yeah I had it somewhere between one and Well, I don't 15. know which ones made it in the barrel. I know it was sanitary when I did it because yeah. I was wearing gloves when I woke up. <laughs> Sounds like a good night. Yeah, yeah. it was great. <laughs> All this to say, mixed fermentation. There's a lot of different ways to do it. <laughs> uh, and then for water chemistry, we have uh, soft dish water. There's kind of a wide range you can do for water chemistry too. And I know with American specifically uh, style wild ales, there is a large range that you can use. I prefer soft dish water just because it's uh, more typical for traditional lambics. Yeah. Um, that's not going to be completely like a you know German style lager soft, but it's going to be on the lower end. Uh, you know, you're gonna, gonna go for an alkalinity of somewhere around uh, 60 to 80 versus you know anything like 120 and above is gonna be a little bit too hard. Yeah. Um, and, and I think uh, sours are actually really <clears throat> forgiving to different water profiles yeah. too. Yeah. So um, I would actually go ahead and just kind of say, you know, for those of you that are like scared of sours or don't want to make that time commitment, just do it. Don't even really, I mean, the use your local water because that's yeah. actually gonna have an impact on the way that sour tastes. And I, I really don't see, you know, whether you have really soft water or really hard water, um, you know, I feel like either way you're going to end up with a perfectly drinkable sour and it will be different depending on your water profile, but that's not necessarily a bad thing in these styles. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. The, the one thing that I'll add on water profile uh, specifically is with alkalinity with your actual pH of your water, the higher alkalinity tradition or typically will actually make your beer more sour in the end. Uh, because you're you're not getting to that uh, that regression stage as quickly, and so more uh, acid is produced, um, basically before the acid-producing bacteria and uh, and yeast start uh, dying off. So you actually, even though the pH might might not be different, to get to like let's say a 3.2 pH, more lactic acid pr is produced, and so the lac the acid is m over that threshold more. Mm -hmm. And so that the beers that that are actually that start with higher alkaline water actually taste more sour in the end. So, exactly. That's the one thing that I'll add. So, fair enough. 
There you go. So that is the water profile for um Before we go into topic sourdough. number one, we should talk about this. Yeah. What was, what's the what's the project that we're drinking right here? Uh, so this was just a homebrew project of mine. Um, I have a friend who has a Mirabelle tree in her backyard. Uh, she actually bought the house of like a master gardener for Manitou oh, Park. Nice. Um, so his house, her house now has all these fruit trees in it that just produce the best fruit I've ever had. Wow. Um, so she had all these golden Mirabelle plums, and I was like, all right, cool, let's put them into something. So. The base malt here was kind of a, inspired by uh, West Ashley, which is a beer from Santi Adarius. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a mixed culture saison. I used actual bottle dregs from Santi Adarius, as well as Brett uh, Lambicus and uh, Rustic from Imperial, which is the uh, Belgian saison yeast, the 3728, mm -hmm. yep. 24. Yep. Um, so did that. It was a mixture of some spelt malt, some triticale, uh, Pilsner base malt, a little bit of rye and some oats. Um, and then it ended up sitting, I didn't do this in oak just cause I was doing this at home and I put it in some carboys. Uh, but it sat in those carboys for about 12 months. And then I transferred it onto a second vessel where I had gotten these fruits. Uh, I actually didn't even sanitize them. I washed them under hot water really quick and split them open, de-seeded them, threw them in the thing. Kind of wanted the natural yeast from the fruit to go in with it. Nice. Um, but I did about three pounds per gallon of plums on this guy. Oh, wow. And it's a, a lot. stupid amount. Well, yeah. <laughs> she let me pick them, and I got over excited. You call it stupid. I call it the right amount. No, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was beautiful, but it was just one of those I, I kept picking, and I realized, oh, I've got like 30 pounds in 10 gallons. Yeah, just throw them all in. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to eat 20 pounds in two days, so why not? Um, but, no, I'm really happy with how this came out. Uh, it was a 1078 OG, and it ended up going down to, like, a 1003, so it's up there. It's yeah. around, was it, 8.5%, 9%-ish? Uh, 78 to 03? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's over 9, actually. That's going to be, like, 9.5. Oh, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Um, cool, cool. <laughs> Good breakfast beer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's uh, it actually kind of brings up a question that uh, uh, Kim Welsh asked, uh, how does mixed fermentation change the ABV calculation method? Uh, in On average, it's in the same ballpark. It's always going to be in the same ballpark, but it's not going to be as exact as you know a standard beer. The reason being some of the mixed fermentation bacteria will actually eat alcohol and turn it into acids or other things. So it's not going to be 100% accurate to go strictly by gravity, but it's going to be in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be pretty darn close. Well, then, I mean, maybe two tenths of a percent might be all the more off you are. Yeah. So. Yeah. Unless you get like, you know, the crazy bacteria that's in like a you know, kombucha, the, that mixed culture will actually eat alcohol and turn it into everything else at a higher degree. So that's possible, but not normal. Mm -hmm. If you see a SCOBY form, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something might have went awry. Yeah. Uh, so when you pitch your yeast and bacteria, do you... Do them at the same time, bacteria first, ale first? Uh, I've kind of done it both ways. So this one specifically, I actually did ale first. So it was the rustic Saison yeast. And then I actually did that in a six-gallon carboy. Uh, I transferred it after the ale was done into a five-gallon carboy to make sure that I had zero headspace. Since I was going to uh, go for so long, I wanted to make sure there was no chance of acetobacter forming in there with no oxygen. But I topped it off with a big starter of all the dregs and the brett and then kind of put it into there. Um, I have done it both ways though, where I co-pitch directly that Lavi and Rose is just a co-pitch of uh, Lactoplantarum yeah. with um, Saison, same rustic. Um, and that's j pitching at the same time. Those are quick sours though. That's something different, which looks yeah. like we're gonna get to later. Yeah. Maybe. Um, and uh, I have done it as well, where it's just been 100% Brett, you know, where you, those are fun ones. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, I've couple different ways you can do it it really just depends on what you're trying to get as the dominant feature of that yeah beer. It, yeah exactly what time what kind of uh, uh end profile are you going for mm -hmm. um and also probably how many dextrins are in yep. the beer which brings <laughs> <laughs> to the next point brings <laughs> us to topic number one <laughs> turbid mashing yeah uh so turbid mashing uh, logan why don't you explain turbid mashing just because I, I feel like i feel like i've been yelling a lot <laughs> oh i like it when you yell more uh, <laughs> Can't turbid you. mashing uh yeah no this is actually something i've i've never really oh, yeah. employed Good. this method myself um but in a nutshell turbid mashing yeah, is yeah, uh we were actually talking about this before the live stream is is sort of the there. opposite of decoction mashing yeah. um uh generally generally the breakdown of the process is that 
Um, you mm -hmm. are doing it's mash like infusions an with yeah, um, with before. water at it. different temperatures, like a traditional step mash would be. However, in between those water infusions, uh, you're actually pulling off uh, the, the basically the runnings from that mash and then putting those in a separate kettle on the side. Um, so you're not actually um, really accumulating water until that mash out. Um, and the process of doing that um, is really effective at um, pulling out all those starches and all those proteins at those real low temperatures. Um, generally, you're gonna start um, right around that like 105 to 113 degree temperature range. Um, so you're actually gonna be pulling those off and trying to put those off to the side to maintain their integrity so that you don't have conversion um, because that is not the goal of a turbid mash. Um, and then a lot of times I see people adding those back in once you reach a mash out temperature of above 170 degrees, um, or sometimes you can just add those right back into your boil kettle when it's all said and done. So um, there is obviously a lot more that goes into it, but that is the, the sort of general concept. The and rundown. So. Uh, and that 105 to 113, that's the, that's traditional mash schedule for Lambic. Uh, however, in this day and age with a with high degree of modified malts, um, the, that's not necessary. I know a lot of people will actually start at 130 degrees. Um, that 105 to 113 is going to be that low end protein rest, pseudo acid rest. Um, but uh, yeah, you will get, uh, is that low enough for ferulic acid? Ferulic acid and uh, that other acid. But uh, it's, it doesn't happen as much with modified malts. And so modified malts have actually denatured the acid forming enzyme. Yeah. 105 should hit that acid rest mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Um. But uh, um, with highly modified malts, it's not as, a, it's not as common or it's not as, a, it's not as necessary, I guess. Yeah. But so, you also have to consider the fact that we are using unmodified malts or completely unmod, uh, unmalted. Um, at least we should be. Adjuncts in these mashes as well, which I guess I kind of skipped right over that too. Um, so yeah, mm. turbid mashing is typically done with, um, like we kind of mentioned earlier, um, uh, usually right around 30% up to even 40%. Probably wouldn't try to push it to 50. <laughs> that, that might be get a, get a little aggressive yeah. um, of, you know, some kind of adjunct malt, um, be it, uh, you know, uh, flaked wheat or flaked oats or unmalted wheat. Um, I know um, Kevin even, you know, threw out some, like, uh, yeah, some triticale and, and some spelt malts. Mm -hmm. um, some are, rye. Some rye, exactly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so you're going to actually have um, a really, really high adjunct load in these as well. And you're doing that on purpose um, to, to pull more of those proteins, to pull more of those um, sort of starches out of, out of the mash without getting full conversion. So, Kevin, what does that give us, and why do we want those dextrins in there? Well, I mean, as you're fermenting, especially with Brett, the dextrins end up kind of giving it some more food, especially for that longer fermentation. You get a little bit more complexity yeah. out of them. Um, you kind of want something for it to just feed on. This beer, for the most part, you're fermenting uh, typically a minimum of six months for anything Brett. At the moment you add any bacteria, Brett, or Petio, Lacto in there, mm. you're going to want it to be at least 12 months, typically 18 months to two, 24 months sometimes. Um, so have it, giving it some, you know, dextrin, kind of something for it to chew on yeah. later in the fermentation lets it be a little bit more complex a little bit less thin a little bit more three three dimensional as opposed to two dimensional so you don't want uh you don't want saccharomyces to eat all the food for everything else yeah pretty much you want to have uh some leftovers for the for the bugs yeah nice uh someone said so no heidelberg uh <laughs> i mean probably still fine but heidelberg is definitely kind of well uh, it's if you do a turbid mash heidelberg is still doable but obviously you're not necessarily using heidelberg for the uh if you can uh, find something a little less modified it'd probably yeah, work for out the for extra the enzymes yeah. If you do a proper turbid mash, though, even Heidelberg. So Heidelberg is also higher in proteins, too. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one thing to note on, too, with, uh, you know, you're talking about Britannomyces eating up all those starches. Um, when you have a mixed fermentation going, um, a lot of people kind of skip over the fact that, um, you know, and I've said it before, but um, yeast and bacteria um, are, are very leaky uh, creatures, <laughs> right? So I like to, you know, tell other people, think of them like a big wiffle ball. Um, they've got tons of holes in them. And so the beauty of Britannomyces is it'll break down those starches. Um, and, you know, through these different metabolic pathways, it'll actually leak out these like intermediate compounds, like, you know, things like pyruvate, right, is the big one. And when you start thinking of things like, I think a good example would be lactobacillus, mm -hmm. um, actually uses the pyruvate 
um, and it can actually use that to end up making lactic, lactic acid. So that's part of its sort of breakdown process. Um, so yeah, so you have Britannomyces that takes the starch, breaks it down into pyruvate as it's trying to make alcohol, and then all of a sudden leaks that out. The lactobacillus that's you know floating around in that beer takes that in and turns that into lactic acid in, mm -hmm. in sort of a very roundabout way. So um, that's why these mixed cultures can end up creating such complex flavor profiles is because it's not necessarily just um, one organism that's creating a flavor. It's actually this sort of symbiosis of a whole bunch of different organisms. And I believe um, like Pediococcus works in a very similar fashion. Mm -hmm. So. Which goes, I think we, uh, did I mention on this one or is that the next one? We're going to, no, so that's in mixed firm schedules. We talked about it in mixed firm schedules, how uh, all these work cyclic, cyclic, cyclically. <laughs> cyclically. Wow. <laughs> that was smooth. Uh, Nailed it. should probably get more beer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all of it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so we, we talked about how this generally uses grist that includes undermodified malts. Um, did we talk about this? We talked a little bit about the steps, but Kevin, what are the, what are the steps-ish normally in a uh, turbid mash? Uh, turbid mash, I mean, typically you, there's, well, we were talking about this a little bit. There's a couple different, like there's cheater methods, but the traditional method, um, for the most part, you're kind of going, uh, you're doughing in some of your malts. Um, don't in your wheat you're malting with 20 percent of your water to achieve about 113 degrees or 45 celsius we were doing a small rest uh you're adding a little bit of water at hotter temperatures typically about boiling um raising your mash temp kind of doing like a step mash like we we're talking about but you're removing liquid and then you're adding that liquid to your brew kettle where you're going to be boiling it and leaving it in your brew kettle mm -hmm. um and i remember you telling me specifically why Oh, so that you do, so you do it, so in the uh, in the per boil kettle you denature the proteins. There it is. Yeah, and then uh, uh, you don't add those back until mash out. So basically, you're trying to get all those proteins and starches to skip sacrification rest. Mm -hmm. so you get that the nice enzymes milky, too. Yeah. Not just the proteins, but yeah. the enzymes. Mm -hmm. as the enzymes most are proteins. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you're doing a step mash, but you're pulling some of the wort out to denature it, put it in the brew kettle, and then you're boiling water to keep topping off the mash ton as you're doing it. Um, I know that the turbid mash ends up being quite a bit more involved than your typical infusion mash, and it takes a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fun fact is, too, when you're done with a turbid mash, for the most part, uh, at least traditional Belgian brewers would do a really long boil. Some yeah. of the brewers, um, who was it again that was doing it, I believe, uh, oil, Lindemann's was brewing it for about 12 hours when wow. they first started. Um, some of the original Flanders nice. breweries. Uh, we're doing it for 30 hours. Oh, wow. Um, I now feel it's, like this is just a way to get drunk and not go home. Well, back then, <laughs> it, Leafman's was doing it for 12-hour overnights, and then they were doing it for, yeah, 30 hours. Uh, back then, the traditional method of boiling that long was because they didn't have the means to get it as hot, so it was a really simmering boil. Yeah. So it wasn't the same blow or boil off that you would have nowadays. Ah, yeah, so interesting. Was, initially, yeah. the thought was like, oh, it's to get your red color yeah. and whatnot, but it was more just they didn't have the meat it was a super super yeah. slow boil we should they do a, a we should do a wood fire, fire yeah i was gonna say kettle. we should do a wood fire beer i'd like be down just, for that'd that that'd be so fun <laughs> yeah. just like start a campfire put something over it and just be like all right it's gonna boil as long as this is well I've, I've wanted to do that and i know that there are certain breweries uh the couple in vancouver uh i believe it's brothers cascadia that has like a cool ship in the back of their truck and they'll basically <laughs> brew they'll pump it into their cool ship and then they'll go drive, they'll drive off and go camp woods. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll, you know, they'll put a mesh screen yes. over it, do it, and then so someone else in a different truck will be there with a big IBC tote, and they'll pump it over to the IBC tote when they're <laughs> oh done, take it back, and pump it into a food or, or barrels. That's awesome. I feel um, like we're doing something wrong now. Which, I know. <laughs> which I've been wanting to do. That being said, I do not know how but that why, works legality-wise, because technically... Because you're not brewing in the brewery? Well, no, no, no. You brew in the brewery, but then you ferment, you get it inoculated Partially somewhere else. But you're not the one doing it. Fair. It's just na just, just <laughs> yeah, nature's doing it. But nothing. Said, no one said anything about the word. I, well, that's technically. I thought fermentation starts the moment yeast or whatever yeah, starts. Yeah, yeah. So isn't that the same thing? So no, because you legally have not pitched yeast. <laughs> but I drove it somewhere to get it and pitched. Uh, so uh, yeah. <laughs> But no, I mean that'd it's be def it's definitely a gray zone, though. Yes, <laughs> I think it's one. Of, I think it's one of, one of those gray zones. It's like, uh, eh, it kind of happened, but uh, you know, yeah. it wasn't my fault. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> happy I little, didn't do it. Happy little accident. <laughs> Call it the Bob Ross. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> but uh, all right. 
Uh, what's next? Uh, so, oh, let's talk about some substitutes, some so some ways to get a similar effect without doing the exact same thing. Without doing a turbid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the cheater methods. The cheater methods. Um, and I've actually done this once. I've done a I've done a cheater method on it. Um, and actually that sour that we talked about with the Rosalaire. Um, and that is, uh, I just did a mash in um, at about 166, 167. And, uh, and so, yeah, mashed in just super, super high, was doing a kind of brew in a bag. Um, so only gave it about a 10 or 15 minute um, rest at that temp and then actually kind of cranked my temp up and, and started bringing it up to a boil. And once I hit about 75 degrees or so, 10, yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, once I hit about 75 degrees or, s or not 75, 175 degrees, then, uh, then I was actually able to just pull that out and continue with my boil and, you know, I some of the numbers I saw that you're trying to shoot for is I want to say about 20% or so. It was like 60% fermentable um, sugars, and then like 20 to 25% of like uh, non-ferment or of uh, actually long chain sugars, mm -hmm. um, and then like 8% of of completely non-fermentable starches in there. So um, I feel like I probably didn't quite get up to that level, but. I, I definitely feel like it was less fermentable than a traditional mash too. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then there's uh, what is it? What is the other method too? There's um, oh so yeah, the adding flour, flour yeah, is so that's, the other cheater method. That's one that I probably wouldn't use. Um, the adding flour one just because uh, I I don't trust the flavor of most flours that people are going to add is the the biggest reason. Yep. Yeah. If you have a nice all grain like fl flour that you got, it's probably a waste of money to do. But uh, uh, it probably is not going to hurt anything. But if you're adding like bleached white flour, I'd probably steer clear of that. Yeah, well, to me that feels like making a hazy IPA with cornstarch. Like, yeah, exactly. It's yeah, like it's, it's it's just not right. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say we're making hazies now. <laughs> <laughs> Hazy lambic. Uh, <laughs> and the other the other one is uh, if you just if you make a bigger grist, so you just up your grist by like twenty percent, you can do a really short mash too. Um, so you're gonna get a lot of sugars out of that mash. Uh, a lot of the sugars are actually already basically readily accessible in your base malts. Um, so that's gonna happen. But if you uh, do a short uh, short mash, you're not giving time for full starch conversions before sparging into your uh, boil kettle. Um, and so you can get a high dextrinous uh, content as well. You're gonna trash your efficiency, which is why you have to add an extra 20% of your, uh, to, to your malt bill. But um, you know that said, it does, it, it's a quick and easy way to kind of get a similar effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's usually a pretty easy thing to do. Most of these beers are fairly low ABV anyway. So, you know, instead of having a, a nine pound mash by doing an 11 pound mash, you're, you know, you're going to get where you need to be. You ain't hurt. You ain't hurting so. muffins. Cast an extra few bucks. Mm -hmm. And saves you a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that's our cheater methods for turbid mashing ish stuff. <laughs> Nailed it. So let's, let's once we stuff. get through the mash and we've got yeast pitched, um, now we got to talk about, uh, well, yeast and the or bacteria um, pitched. Let's talk about what we're going to do to sort of let this beer age out and kind of the schedules involved mm -hmm. with, with, you know, the time it takes when it comes to actually having a beer going from, hey, I pitched some funkiness in there. How, what, what do I do now? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's talk about that. So uh, uh, first, so the, the, the time that it takes is going to be kind of really dependent on the beer and what all is in there. But, uh, uh, well, let's start with this as an example because this is a fantastic beer. How long after you pitched your mixed culture did you let this uh, sit, uh, sit around? So uh, it was clean culture, like I said. Uh, so it was sack for about two weeks. Um, and then I transferred it to a secondary where I had pitched a big uh, propagated culture of bottle drags and some Brett packets I bought from here, actually. Um, and then that sat on those dregs for about, it'd be 11 months and two weeks. So about 12 months, let's say. Nice. Um, and then from there, it got on. That's when it was the plums, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then it was, the plums were added, and the plums were, it was left on for about six weeks. I kind of wish I had left it on the plums a little bit longer, because I do pick up a tiny bit of THP on this. Yeah. Um, GSP, THP, THP. Um, not TSP. THP. Not TSP, yeah. <laughs> That'd be bad. Uh, THP on this, and that's um, just because of the stone fruits and the amount of oats. I think it just needed a longer rest period on the fruit. Yeah. Beer is very good, but it's just barely there. It's a little cheerio y. Also, the, uh, um, uh, the, by, the, by the year end, most of the sack has probably died. I mean, the yeah. strong fermenters are going to be the ones that are. Um, the the breads and yeah, the whatnot. Yeah, the breads well, and lacto. So the barrel I just emptied at my house. Um, 
it's sitting on cherries right now to do like a creek inspired beer nice and it had been in the barrel for two full years of all those dregs and it was completely calmed down it was down to a 10 0 like there was nothing left and i put it into a uh, stainless steel sankey with the spear pulled um with a bunch of cherries and it's already been blowing up it keeps overflowing on me i have to change the airlock every <laughs> nice. day because those cherries added new sugars and the brett is still alive in there somehow yeah still going, still going um, trying to blow. there's been cases of brett surviving like 80 years yep like yeah. crazy amounts of time well it's just weird you would think you know two years later like okay nothing's i'm just gonna cherry yeah. it and we're gonna be good but no it took right off and it's still going i want to transfer it because i'm really excited about this but i'm watching it bubble I'm yeah like, all right i'm just Gotta leave it for another probably six months on that on the cherries like that. That's why Brett's my cure all for like if someone tells me they accidentally made a bad beer or beer they don't like, I'm just like add Brett and let it sit for a year. Yeah, see what happens. At, at a <laughs> minimum, it might be good. If yeah. at a max hour, or I mean worst case scenario, who cares? Yeah, you know you were gonna dump it anyways. It's worth a try. Yeah, you're or at, you might have a little extra money. And, yeah, you might come yeah. out with something great. Yeah, and uh, so Brett eats everything too. Like Brett, uh, Saccharomyces is very specific on what it can and can't eat, basically. But yeah. Brett eats everything, including al- a lot of Brett strains. So not all Bretts, but a lot of Brett strains even eat alcohol. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know they'll also re-eat whatever that they turned alcohol into, and then eat something. You know. Well, my favorite thing about the Brett too is that it eats the autolysis cells, so the dead yeah. the dead yeast cells. So if you're co-pitching with sac and you're worried about you have to transfer it off the sac to get it from that autolysis flavor. Yeah. All right. Cool. If there's Brett in there, you don't need to transfer it because that's now food for the Brett. Which is why Solaris works so well. Yep. Yeah. And I don't mind a little acetaldehyde in, in my sours. I think, I think it's good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's no. that green apple flavor that yeah. you get for Brett all those. Brett lamb, I think, is uh, – well, Folks it's certain there. strains of Brett lamb that are the primary culprits for creating a little acetaldehyde by metabolizing alcohol, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so Brett's a really fun thing to – if you ever make a bad beer, add Brett to it and <laughs> – Let's see what happens. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the different types of sours for a little bit because uh, um, there are different ways to do sours. There's a the natural sour, which is like that, that mixed fermentation. There's also kettle sours. Yeah. Uh, and well, it's funny because that's the what's the office meme joke of why make why spent or why waste time make lambic when quick sour do trick. Yeah. Is um, <laughs> the the kettle sours are what a bunch of American breweries did because Americans are impatient, and so they damn right we are. They were taking a beer and trying to get a sour character within the two to three week normal turnaround schedule, as opposed to waiting 12 to 24 to 36 months for a beer the traditional way. Yeah. Um, But this would create a much more one dimensional product, but it's also a much more approachable sour for the mass consumption. Yeah. Most Americans and most people in general are not used to this complex sour that really hits back here. They want, oh, that's a tart fruit juice. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. um, So that kind of beer you'll use. A kettle sour, which is typically either a probiotic uh, infusion or a probiotic addition, or you're using a lactobacillus strain and you're doing a kettle sour in which you're boiling it off and killing the yeast before you ferment. Yeah. Um, or you are sometimes just using a, a higher concentration of acidic malts yeah. to try and drop the pH on the mash before you actually even ferment and you're not using any bacteria whatsoever. And there's a couple different ways to... Uh, uh, so you, you talked about with your... I forget what you call it. The Lavie and Rose. Lavie and Rose, yeah. So you actually, instead of boiling, you just co-pitch both. Uh, both. I'm, I'm lazy. Um, so I like to co-pitch, but I also feel like I get a little bit more complex character yeah. that way. And, and not letting the, <coughs> the lacto die off. Yeah, I'm letting the lacto die off on its own. Plantarum 2, which I used using Good Belly. Um, Good Belly is a probiotic drink that has lactoplantarum in it. Mm-hmm. Um, when you co-pitch it like that, Good Belly, or Plantarum specifically has a zero IBU tolerance. And uh, lactobacillus isn't that hard to clean out of your equipment. So I'm never worried about like cross, cross-contamination. Yeah, that's smart. Um, and since it has a zero IBU tolerance, any other beer I have it's does gonna, it. And yeah. I just do an extra cleaning cycle. So if I'm brewing a clean beer, I'll do the clean cycle once. If I do a sour beer, I'll probably do it three times with that. Yeah. Just in my soft tubes and whatnot. That's smart. But the Good Belly, yeah, I mean, I will co-pitch Lactoplantarum and Saison. The Saison I use, uh, 3724 or Rustic. Yeah. It specifically says to go up to like 90 degrees for fermentation. So you can get that same like uh, temperature range for both of them. Yeah. yeah. And plantarum, the nice thing is, is the low it's, end of the temperature. It's spectrum. 64 degrees to about 115. Yeah. And even if I'm at 70 degrees, I'm still getting the uh, acid production that I need from that bacteria, yeah. which is awesome. And then you're co-pitching and it just kind of works together. And plantarum's a, it's, it's almost a cheater lactobacillus because it also doesn't produce a lot of the other off flavors that some 
lactobacillus strains can produce. Mm. Uh, uh, you don't get the butyric acid. Uh, at least I've never gotten butyric acid from uh, Yeah, I haven't. That. The big butyric acid thing that I've noticed is when people are doing actual kettle sours, so not when they're co-pitching. Uh, when you're doing a kettle sour, you'll make your mash, you'll put it in the brew kettle, you'll raise it up, drop it down to about 105, wherever you want to pitch your lactobacillus bacillus at, yeah. and you'll kind of let it sit in there. You'll pitch your lactobacillus overnight, it'll drop, or over a couple nights, hopefully not. Uh, it'll drop the pH down, and then you'll bring it back up to a boil to kill all the bacteria, and then you'll proceed as normal. Pitch it into a fermenter and pitch your normal sack. You have no live bacteria in there because you've boiled it and killed it, but the pH has already been dropped on the mash. This is how most American breweries do it for a kettle sour. Um, but with that, the risk is that you're sitting overnight, and most lactobacilluses are anaerobic is that what i'm thinking of is? yeah anaero yeah they prefer to be anaerobic yeah they prefer to be anaerobic so if I there's ox facultative anaerobes is that mm -hmm. the correct word yeah and so if you end up doing this typically you want to blanket it well there's kind of mixed arguments on this of with co2 in yeah. the kettle um and maintain that temperature but if there's oxygen in the kettle and not enough co2 to blanket it the oxygen reacts with the lactobacillus and creates a lot of butyric yeah and that's where it's that baby vomit which Always, great flavor always great flavor <laughs> uh we've had a couple from some breweries i remember we opened at a bottle share and yeah. you could smell it from across the room mm, and it was just nice <laughs> like ah don't drink that yep um it's not gonna hurt you it's the same stuff that's in your bile but yeah it's just more about the flavor and the yeah, aromatics just not a fun just flavor specifically the, the aromatics <laughs> mainly the aromatics yeah um and hits highly home. aromatic molecule <laughs> yeah hits home especially for uh you know those of us who have had babies uh, uh yeah no but yeah, um, I would say uh, for most, like I said, most brewery production wise, you're doing a kettle sour where it is souring in the mash tun and then bringing it up. The big problem with this as a homebrew sketch thing, it's kind of hard to maintain that temp overnight if you were trying to do a kettle sour. Yeah. Unless you want to leave your burner on all night while you're asleep and watch the house burn down, which I don't recommend. Yeah. Um, unless you got like really good insurance. Yeah. yeah. Or if you have. So my mash tun in my homebrew system was one of those homebrew coolers. It's insulated, and it drops maybe a degree every 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, it's not that bad. If you insulate the absolute fuck out of it, you had some kind of heating element, maybe. But even that, I don't feel secure yeah, enough we, to leave for 24 hours and not watch. We've done a – we've used, like, our anvils like our, or our mash and boils, like the little yeah. electric. And they have, like, low wattage density things that you can, like, put on a low heat and kind of make those. So I think something like the anvil actually works pretty well for doing that. And that's – I have done it in my cooler once where I put a small space heater. It was in the basement. I wrapped it in, like, three blankets, and it worked. But, again, the anaerobic part is why I j it's just not worth the risk for that. Yeah. When the co-pitch method for me always has worked, that good belly is reliable. Yeah. And it's cheap. Honestly, good I belly think is three bucks a carton, and I use uh, – yeah. when I was brewing at the Seven Barrel Brewery up north um, – we were doing eight good belly containers per batch for a seven barrels. Yeah, I think that's what uh, exactly what Cam did when he was at, yeah. uh, at Young Buck. Yeah, it was well, that's who I learned it from. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which actually oh. is much more reasonable. I've, I've heard of people doing like two cartons in a five gallon batch, and I'm like, why? And that's why your beer tastes like yogurt. To a five yeah. gallon batch? No, no, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you use, they have the capsules that are like the four ounce shots. Oh, they use yeah. about two of those for five gallons. Or about half a carton for a 10 gallon yeah yeah so less is more when it comes to that yeah and, it'll uh, grow and you the big thing is too too much of it you're gonna get so much sour it's nice to kind of ease into it yeah know? well and i definitely think i fall into that same category as you do when it comes to co-pitching and uh and then when really trying to uh, but i do it a little bit differently i will usually pitch uh my lacto and and um and try to warm it up, like you said, mm -hmm. um, but actually just give it about a day or so head start before pitching my sack on top of it. And okay. and I've yeah, done that. Pitches a sack. And yeah. I've done, <laughs> I've done that before too. Yeah. Um, where you pitch the lacto a couple of days and then you get the co pitch, but you're picking pitching yeah. sack later just to kind of pre acidify. I remember yeah. when I did it my first time. I was on a Goza, and it definitely had a Gatorade vibe. Oh, oh really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which, See, I've, I've had really great luck. It, it no, tends I mean, it, to. It's cool though, because I'm not sucks. saying it was bad. Just yeah. when I took the sample before I pitched the sack. Gatorade. After that, it was great, but it was just like, yeah. Okay, it's very uh, saline. Yeah, and I think it does produce a milder sour that way, yeah. unless you do, unless you do have a way to, like you said, get it up to like you know 110 degrees or something crazy like that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it it yeah, it just it seems to be really clean and it's it's easier, right? Yeah. It's easier than messing with a Less kettle sour. Is, is 
So we, nice. Yeah, exactly. We kind of do the same thing with us, except for we uh, we pitch acid malt for ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the same reason that it pre-acidifies, and so we Which can get I do down that below too. four. Yeah, before below four point five at least. Um, Technically, food safe is below 4.2, but you're fine below 4.5. How much of acidulated malt are you using to drop your pH? For a five-gallon batch, about two pounds. About two pounds. Okay, so yeah. quite a bit. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm always aiming on I'll aim, any of my beer. I always aim for about 3 to 4% for any sour of acidulated malt just to kind of help. Yeah. It's just like a little like a, a nudge out the door kind of thing. Obviously, I'm using bacteria to actually get it there. Yeah, because you want that, that natural fermentation flavor. Yeah, but I still add just a little bit. I'm not adding 10%. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. It's quite a bit. But we and we do whole grains and we do it in the fermentation, so it's got not, it. Okay. It's not mashed. So we'll, if we mash, we might mash like uh, we might mash that same amount, but that's not going to pre-acidify down below four point five. So that raised me a question too. I was reading an article. Uh, my buddy Zane actually gave me the idea of doing a beer to Mars in one of those barrels we got at Paramore, uh-huh. and um, reading an article about how they'll literally throw some grain directly into the fermenter mm-hmm. and do it that way so that's apparently how you're doing it with that's yeah, and that's what we yeah we inoculate so we, we don't use any uh we don't use any other pitches we just inoculate with uh with actual just, raw grain from yeah. the bag and just throw it in and there's a fun uh, uh article that i was reading that actually talked about the different bacteria that are on acid producing bacteria based malts acid acidulated malt because mm-hmm. um, acidulated malt are naturally fermented which is why i like using them They've got that natural fermentation yeah. acidification flavor. Um, but it's not just lactobacillus that's in there. It's also Wysela. Yeah. And Wysela is another uh, acid-producing bacteria, very similar to in the same order as lactobacillus. I don't think the same family. Um, so it's it's lactobacillus adjacent, but like it's th- it's third cousin. Um, the cousin that's like, you know, you didn't know about and then you accidentally slept with and then you're like, oh, my bad. Uh, yeah, totally. Been there. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, on that note, but Spokane why? is very cool, guys. I don't know where that came I'm from. just trying to figure out where that analogy came from. I feel like but we yeah. just wrap it up. Right yep. <laughs> All right, bye. Why sell us a, you know what? Just, uh, well, I mean, that is the last point. It's almost there, actually. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, don't actually say So, yeah, that. different ways to know. inoculate beer. <laughs> Wysela is a fun bacteria. By the way, it creates different flavors in lactobacillus, uh, but it also is a lactobacillus producing or lactic acid producing bacteria. Um, yeah, so now we're on to uh, different ways to inoculate. So we've talked about pitching drigs. We've talked about uh, uh, wood. Let's talk about wood. Yeah. Um, so like you were saying, there's a couple of me- methods. You can use Solera's, uh, which you <laughs> I'm still laughing about that. <laughs> I <know>. <laughs> <laughs> articles, yeah. No, I mean uh, – <laughs> One of the big things, uh, when you're fermenting, you'll put it into barrels <laughs> is traditional. Uh, barrels yeah. are semi-permeable, so you kind of get a little bit of oxygen ingress, which is kind of... Yep, you do. Uh, yeah. That's a big, that's big a point big, using them. Yeah, yeah. So, so you kind of want a little bit of oxygen, uh, not an excessive amount. If you're using a smaller barrel on a homebrew schedule, uh, there's different waxings that you put around it, depending on the size of the barrel, so you don't have too much oxygen ingress on yeah. the surface yeah. area. Yeah. Um, I will add some wood chips on the summer mark, and then you can actually harvest those chips, and they'll actually, the they're so porous that basically the bacteria will cling to them. It's almost impossible to clean yeah. bacteria off wood, which is a great way of repitching. <laughs> Sorry, you got me. still talking about the cousin thing. Uh, it's, get it. it's on my mind now. <laughs> impossible to clean that off. Um, and uh, I recommend a nice cleanup. Clean up. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, the wood is. <laughs> <laughs> the wood is uh, porous, so the bacteria will actually cling to it. It's almost impossible to clean out the bacteria from the wood. So actually, what I've been able to do is basically inoculate it. You take that wood and you take put it, chip, throw it on your next one. If you're using oak chips, cubes, whatever, awesome. If not, you're actually using the barrel. When you take the barrel out, you can do a hot water rinse, yep. hot water wash on it. But those bacteria are still in the wood. So it's still going to keep fermenting your beer, which is kind of... Um, Similar, Solera adjacent, but not the same thing as, as, as Solera. But yeah. yeah, having that as a natural knockout, it's the quike method. We'll call it the quike method. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice um, nice thing, too, is most breweries, or a lot of breweries, will do it in a stainless. They'll ferment clean, like I did with this, doing a sack strain first. And then you're transferring that onto a barrel that was inoculated. When you were done with the barrel, you empty it, you clean it. And by cleaning, I'm just being hot water rinse. You're not using chemical on wood yeah. because it's porous. And you don't want the chemical yeah. compounds in the wood. But those bat- bugs that are in that wood are now going to inoculate the next batch that are going in there. Sometimes you'll still want to pad a little bit of bugs just to give it a boost, but a lot of the times the wood itself will have enough bugs in it that it'll start to inoculate and grow. That's probably my favorite way to uh, to uh, to do mixed culture beers, just because 
I think it's the most natural and the oldest way. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily think it always makes the best flavors, but it always makes good flavors. And it's just kind of one of those like, I'm doing this the way it was meant to be done. Yeah, but there's something also like aesthetically pleasing to walk into a brewery and just see oak. Everywhere. Exactly. It's the beer porn the <laughs> factor of <Yeah>. like, <laughs> that's some nice wood right there. I like that wood. That's you right. Know. Speaking of speaking of porn, someone uh, said 100 likes and Logan will pitch his sack into on uh, OnlyFans. Uh, only <laughs> oh, uh, oh, what was <laughs> we were talking? Why? Why is it true? always me? <laughs> we were talking. A buddy of mine and I were talking about this as soon as the pandemic hit, and there's so many beer influencers that are you know showcasing the uh, beers and stuff like that yeah. and doing it only cans <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's just uh people <laughs> just drinking beer cans and they're under yeah and the, yeah and the, but yeah. that's the entire page is this only cans i love it i'm all for it uh, or just shotgunning a beer naked and we logan. should yeah <laughs> we can uh, logan definitely do that so we're gonna do that for sure so we're gonna but let's do like a whole collaborative everyone in spokane only cans page okay so no i've pitched this years ago we were at the inland <laughs> what was that the inland northwest like the brewers association here yeah. and i said as a fundraiser for charity we should do a sexy brewers calendar there were 12 breweries oh, in the sure. time I and if we now. can get yeah, yeah. yeah if we can get in on it everyone does a page we all do donate the proceeds to the local charity yeah and no one wanted to do it they did it in san diego and it's the best thing ever there were some i mean you obviously didn't ask me. Uh, oh, I, there were a couple people that wanted to do it. Cameron was one that said no, actually. What? He said he didn't want his daughter to see it, find find it later in his life. That's which, true. I, I've seen Cameron naked, and that would be embarrassing would if be, his daughter saw that. Yeah, blinding. <laughs> <laughs> it's very white. But uh. no, I wanted. To, I mean, the one that they did in San Diego, they had the mash paddle just perfectly positioned to cover stuff. It was great because uh, it's just a bunch of brewers which you know is you know just beer guts and yeah exactly the greatest oh, possible like nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. i'll pass uh yeah. all right the last uh, the last uh, ways to inoculate that i have pitch or open is uh, uh, on the list nailed it <laughs> it's open fermentation open fermentation we talked about a little bit um and there's ways to do that basically by bringing your wort out into nature like a, mm -hmm. you know the the truck with a um and a cool ship yeah cool so ship, yeah. the traditional method in belgium at least in the flanders flemish region like breweries like Cantillon or uh, Dre Fontaine, they'll use what's called a cool ship. But essentially, it's a shallow pan. Um, there's a certain ratio for it so that you're getting a volume <laughs> cool to. Shit. Cool ship. Yeah, it's cool basically ship. a volume to service cool ratio ship. that'll cool your wort from boiling down to about 68. But it take you need it to be at a certain rate for that cooling, and you can only do it during certain times of the year because of the cool rate that it needs to be at. Yeah. So it ends up being, you want it in about eight hours for that cool time, if I remember correctly. It's six to eight hours, roughly. Yeah, to, I mean, it's going to depend on the outside temperature, and it's also going to depend on the surface area. To well, I mean, that that's yeah. your range that you want for the cooling rate. Oh, yeah. You don't want it to be faster than that because you're not going to get enough bugs to actually ferment, or bugs being bacteria and yeast in there. And if you go f cooler or slower than that eight-hour period, you're, you're going to get too like much, that. and you're going to get some you know, botulism kind of stuff, yeah. which I don't recommend. Um, I mean, again, it'll be alcohol. You'll be okay, but it'll just <laughs> taste like death. Yeah. Um, uh, so the cool ship is basically just an open pan that they'll do. Uh, most breweries, like we said, they have room specifically for this yeah. where they'll pump the wort up into their, like Cantillon, it's up on their attic, and they have windows that are up there. They've just got screens so that bugs and birds don't come and take a shit in the cool ton, cool ship. But um, – they will just let it sit there overnight. Uh, typically, this happens late fall, early spring kind of time frame. I know DeGuard just finished up there or just started their season yeah. down in Tillamook because it hit that temperature. Uh, you want it around that 37 or 34 to 40 degree range at night yeah. so that the cooling rate is about where you want it. Um, as a home brewer, if you're trying to do it, the problem is making a cool ship, shallow pan, that cooling rate is going to be much too fast because of the volume you actually have in there. Typically, the recommended method is just taking your brew kettle when you're done, sticking it outside, putting a screen over it, letting yeah. it go and until it cools down, then pumping it to a fermenter. Uh, mixed results to this. I've never done it before, but I also have two dogs that shit in the backyard, so I <laughs> don't want those bacteria. you got to find uh, a, a nice, uh, again, a nice this, outside area for This it. is where I want to go camping with a brew kettle. Yeah. And it'd be cool to do that. It's just a lot of equipment. My girlfriend's never agreed to bring it all the time. <laughs> we're going camping. We're going camping, Kevin, not... We're bringing your whole yeah. brew set. Not up. going brewing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a rack on the top of the roof. She won't even know this. I'll just strap it down. There, there. you go. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there are different. Yeah, there's a couple different ways. If you're as a home brewer, that's a way. Again, you know, you don't know what you're getting. You're gonna end up getting a bunch of different bugs and bacteria and natural yeast in the area. 
could be good, could be horrible. Um, Cantillon, which I was very surprised when I went there in Belgium, they're, some, they're regarded as some of the best sours in the world for the natural cool ships. Uh, their brewery was in the middle of town, and it was right next to the railway station. It was not in a clean area. Like, there was trash on the floor, but their cool ship was right there. Yeah. But there's farms about, you know, 50 kilometers away. And so the natural yeast coming yeah. from the farm. So here in Spokane, we have a similar situation with Green Bluff up there. So I'm excited. Uh, That'd Anthony, really fun. Anthony yeah. and us at Paramore, we were talking about getting a cool ship and trying to do that kind of method. That'd be and awesome. Once we get our spot, specifically because there is natural yeast yeah. in this area. There's a lot of agriculture that happens over here. Um, so it's more about getting that natural stuff. I've been wanting to do that, like take a trip down to Yakima for that exact same reason. Yeah. You get natural wild yeast that are coming off these fruits, off of these plants, off of the agriculture. So a um, couple different ways. And that, so uh, Cantian also has the advantage of you know, having uh, their, uh, um, their cool ship area in a, semi, in a, a room that has, you know, uh, porous material. Yeah. So, you know, after you've done it for, 100 200 years whatever the yeast uh, is on that wood <laughs> exactly yeah. so you're, you're, you're kind of good to go because you've got all your your inoculants right there i forgot which brewery it is it's in the midwest it's not american solera but there was a brewery that they literally had fooder crafters of america build them a straight up wood using wood from old fooders like as yeah. the cedar cedar planking you know right and it was like that and so they'd food her in there and it was in the middle of their brewery and they had just like a ventilation to like to the window to the walls yeah <laughs> and so <laughs> And then the natural yeast would be coming in, but it would also <laughs> inoculate that wood, and then it would do that on the next batch so yeah. they could kind of brew year-round like that. That's my pipe dream, eventually. Yeah. Well, that way, too, when they were doing it that way, if they were brewing in the middle of summer, they could actually temperature control that room. Yeah. And then the wood would be inoculated, and then it would inoculate it. Yeah, that'd be that perfect. Area. That's why I always say when you uh, want to inoculate a brewery, you just spill yeast everywhere. Yeah. You helped us with that one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got, yeah, the Bukaki beer. That was great. <laughs> Don't uh, you forgot to tell me it was under pressure when I went to go transfer it. Out. It's <laughs> always under pressure. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> we uh, probably got time for maybe two or three questions before we got to close this uh, thing out. Because so, we do have people like waiting at the door today. Yeah, people actually want to buy stuff. I know, right? What is, what's wrong with them? Well, and we're gonna be doing more um, uh, season two, episode two. Yeah. So I, I saw a really great question <laughs> on here about uh, potentially souring a mead uh, oh yeah let's get that one down. and uh yeah so honey naturally is going to be a little bit tart yeah right so honey's got some acidity to it um but i would say um i've seen it done before yeah a couple of reasons i at propolis i believe did yeah. one actually i think using because the uh, they have these uh garden path has done one over in skagit valley up in in uh, washington yeah because garden path actually has a winery and a brewery license so they're doing wine mead cider beer um but they've done it with a cool ship with their mead oh nice i feel like so my, my one thought about that i, I feel like you'd have to different. maybe play with starch additions or something like that or you'd have to direct pitch either bread or lactobacillus first um i don't think if you did a co-pitch with sack i don't think it'd work the same way no yeah. it's not the same yeah yeah and it would be i would say yeah using lacto or Britannomyces in there to ferment i mean you could use bread purely to ferment the um the mead too i don't think you'd necessarily get that acidity you want from it um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and it'd probably come out more mild yeah, but at the same time. I think it could work really well. So, um, yeah, a little kind of sweet tart flavor going mm -hmm. on there is, is what I can kind of see, see happening. So, um, yeah, mead, uh, sour mead. That sounds great. Um, and on I've seen to people doing that with some ciders too, as well. Yeah. It's kind of letting them, I had a buddy who was doing some natural fermentation with, uh, ciders, um, kind of just, you know, not putting any camden tablets or anything in there just kind of yeah. letting it go perfect um so let's see we got one more and then i'm gonna go get ready to close out one more ah oh, man yeah sorry everyone we, we ran a little late today um and i'm trying to find the best question uh okay here's a really good all-around one um carter's asking um uh, he says his ipas are tasting a little malty and he's wondering if it's the two row that he is using um that is possible, but that is also unlikely. Um, I would say if you want your IPAs to finish drier, make sure that you are mashing on the low end of the spectrum. We usually mm -hmm. mash in about 145 here for our IPAs, and then we also keep our total grain bills real simple. Um, so um, more than likely, if you have anything that's not two-row, if you have, I know some in the comments, if you have crystal malts, yeah. if you have 
you know, other richer, sweeter malts in there. Um, those are going to add a lot to an IPA that don't necessarily need to be there. So mm -hmm. A lot of crystal malts is what I've seen. It's always add too much. Yeah. So, yeah, I would start by dropping out any crystal malts and then also uh, dropping that um, overall mash temperature. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, otherwise, um, thank you, everyone, for tuning into our live stream today. Hey, please give it a quick like before we close this out because uh, I see there's only 48 likes today. Um, and uh, we will... Um, if you want to support us, please go to our uh, our website and consider purchasing some swag. Otherwise, um, thank you so much. We will see you again next week at 8.45 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, thank you, Kevin, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, All right. Thank you, everyone. We will see you next time on uh, Genus Brewing. Oh. Shut that down, Peter.